Welcome to the Harnessing Your Divine Feminine Show, hosted by Andrea Bagby. We believe that when you give a woman an opportunity, you give her the world. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our videos. Hello, welcome to our show. Thank you for watching Harnessing Your Divine Feminine, where we give women opportunities because they are creating our world. Today we have with us Teresa Wilson, and she's one of my longtime friends and mentors, and she's just done so many divine things. Like You're like, you are the divine feminine walking around, and the you're, earth angel. <laughs> <laughs> you're too kind. I look at you at the, as the same way. You are an entrepreneur in ways that I never dreamed of. So it, we, we support each other. We learn from mm -hmm. each other and it's a lovely relationship that yes. we have. And, and I really look to you to learn new things about the metaphysical mm -hmm. space. Okay. Excellent. And mm -hmm. I've learned so much from your metaphysical experience. Like you came up in a time where it wasn't like you couldn't just YouTube. Oh, that's right. Um, I want to give some credit to some of my ancestors Absolutely. and, I think they are the foundation and the reason I had an inspiration to study mysticism or magic or uh, spirituality. On my maternal side, my grandmother was a devout member of a very conservative Methodist church. She was a country <laughs> girl, very conservative, but she spoke to Jesus and not in the way that people say, I pray to Jesus. She saw Jesus in 3D and asked Jesus for certain things to happen, and she conversed with him. She was psychic. She was psychic. Okay. She would never have called it that. Right. She right. would have called it her prayer group, you know, <laughs> and there were um, 12 women in her prayer group, and every time I needed something, I would call my grandmother and say, I need you to get the dirty dozen to start praying. I love that. And they would help me through any crisis. And I had a lot of faith that whatever they prayed for would happen in my life. On my paternal side, I've only learned about the strength of my connection to religion and spirituality in the last few years when I was studying genealogy because I had a really unusual maiden name C-I-S-S-E-L-L. -S -S -E -L -L. And people always said, well, that's a, a German name, but it's not in a German name. It's actually a Welsh name. And it turns out that my fourth great grandfather immigrated from Ireland, England, Wales to Baltimore. And there was a robust Catholic community there. And uh, John Augusta Sissel decided to be a missionary mm -hmm. and to bring the Catholic faith to Kentucky. And he took half a dozen people, many of his sons, some of his sons and some other people, and they set across the wilderness to settle in a little river community in Western Kentucky. And if you look at where that particular surname exists in this country, it's all in Baltimore and that little area of Western Kentucky. And it's because they were zealots about the Catholic faith mm -hmm. and brought it uh, forward to that part of the country. And that's the family that I was born into. And all of that side of my family are very devout Catholics. So, when my mother mm -hmm. raised a Methodist, mm -hmm. married a, my father a Catholic, back in the 1950s, the non-Catholic had to swear that they would raise the children in the Catholic faith or the marriage couldn't occur in the church. Wow. So my mother, uh, and, and in fact, you couldn't have a religious wedding if you were a non-Catholic. Non it was yeah. very different. And so my mother made that vow and the children, we were all raised in the Catholic faith and in a, an elaborate cathedral, you know, the marble, the incense, the Very mysticism pretty, of it. Yeah. It was a wonderful way to develop your faith. And, and along with that, I went to Catholic schools through high school. So you get uh, an immersion into Catholicism. 
But the wonderful thing about having nuns and priests teach you is that they know the inner mysteries, mm -hmm. particularly the nuns. Okay. And the nuns who taught me knew that love and service were the keys to grace the keys to finding your own spirituality and your own connection with the divine. And from the priests, I got a love for ceremony and ritual. And there is nothing like being in a hot church Lent, fan, at Lent time, fanning your face from the heat oh. and having <laughs> that censer put out yes. lo, uh, you know, clouds of incense for you. And you, you become uh, accustomed to and appreciative of the rituals. And at the time, they were all done in Latin. Mm -hmm. So you were speaking a different, a different language. You were in this mystical environment. And that really was the foundation of my spirituality. My psychic grandmother talking to Jesus and my uh, ritualistic uh, side that I got from my family and uh, school. So what happened to me is that in high school, I thought I felt such a strong longing to, for the spiritual world mm -hmm. that I thought I really wanted to be a nun. Well, for reasons that we don't need to explore here, <laughs> that didn't work didn't out. Didn't work for you. Didn't <laughs> work out. And so I was in a chapel. I used to go to mass every day. I was in a, the school, high school chapel. And I said, God, I'm going to get back to you because this isn't it. I'm just going to wait for something to happen so that I'm inspired to get back into spirituality. So I went to college and went through some life experiences, relationships and all. And then uh, in the late 1970s, I was going to move to Atlanta. And I started making trips to the city and I said, I want to feel the neighborhood where I want to live. Okay, I love it. So I came <laughs> weekend after weekend and I said, where is it that I want to live? And I drove through Little Five Points. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I saw a sign that said, Ravenwood Church and Seminary of the Old Religion. And I thought, what is that? You were like, I must go. <laughs> <laughs> and there was an open house. And it turns out it was the first public church of witchcraft in the United States. So this was in the 1970s. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. Um, at the time we had, uh, so I went to an open house there and I decided that's the neighborhood I want to live in. If they're tolerant of this very different religion. And, uh, you know, at the time there were lots of alternative lifestyle right, people right. in little five points. And I said, this is the community I wanted to live. So I rented an apartment in Virginia Highlands and I didn't start, uh, attending any particular church. I just wanted a, a community of like-minded people to live in. So I really started going uh, to a place that no longer exists up in Ansley Park uh, to take uh, beginning classes. There were uh, fairs of all sorts of mystical uh, varieties, everything from Scientology to Theosophy. And what I really found that I liked was uh, the Theosophical Church, which is based in Chicago, but has strong roots in India, and the Rosicrucian Society in San Jose, California. So I began studying with them in the late 1970s and continue to this mm -hmm. day. I'm still a student of both groups. But I wanted uh, something in person. And in the uh, Atlanta community in the little five points community, there were every, there was every kind of alternative church that you could imagine. Uh, the Moonies, the tantric yoga, right. group, um, you know, just anything that you wanted. There were lots of communes there, but I decided that since this one sign, let me find my neighborhood, I would go there for classes. And the open house that I attended was on the first day of May 
And I asked the priest there, a gentleman from England named Merlin. Uh, that, that was, of course, that's not, not a coincidence. No, it's not. <laughs> no. So he, he had a Q&A session and I said, well, what is the real meaning of life? And he said, it's to learn. And I'll never forget that that resonated with me because although I'm not a practitioner of any religion at all, mm -hmm. I say that I believe in omnism. I accept and believe every religion. Right. And that's my faith. But what I did was study every religion. Mm -hmm. I studied at the Dharma Datu Center and studied, you know, uh, studied Zen Buddhism. I studied um, at the, uh, I've studied Hinduism. I've been, I've uh, danced with the Sufis. Very cool. and the whirling dervishes and done uh, that. But I did academic study at that church of the old religion. And the reason that that resonated is that when you believe in Wicca or the old relig religion, it has ritual. So that resonated Absolutely. with my Catholicism. There's a certain way you do things at a certain time. There is, and, and it, it resonated with me because the religion rec recognizes God and goddess. Well, in the Catholic church, you have the Trinity, right? but you also have a veneration of Mary, right. the mother of Christ. Mm -hmm. And you see her in these beautiful robes, uh, pink and blue robes, mm -hmm. usually standing on the earth with the baby in her arms, the mother goddess. Right. But she had been an ancient goddess. Uh, the mother earth goddess. And that is how you think of the divine feminine mm -hmm. as a woman who's of the earth bringing forth life. Right. But in the Wiccan faith, they're equal. There is a priest and a priestess, right. a God mm -hmm. and a goddess, but they are one of all. Right. And that really made sense to me. It brought back the divine feminine on par with the divine masculine which in many religions today, many church-based religions, the feminine is missing. The divine it goddess really is. is entirely mm -hmm. missing. And of course, I came out of a generation where there were social justice movements, civil rights, women's rights, gay rights. Right. That's what, uh, that's the environment I came from. So to see a religion that uh, promoted the divine feminine. Right. It was, it made sense Absolutely. to me. Absolutely. Absolutely made sense. So I studied there. I uh, did well, you know, in my studies. And as a course of your studies, you know, if you think of the stereotypical witch, they've got to have a crystal ball, they've got to read tarot right. cards, they've got to know all about <laughs> the deadly herbs and, yeah, right. and, you know, how to do <laughs> potions and all of that. Yeah. And of course I do. But, uh, but, but what you learn, I mean, you know, that's the first stage of what I call baby witchery. You know, oh, I'm I'm going to put on my mystical makeup and clothing mm -hmm. and I'm going to read your tarot mm -hmm. cards and I have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. What you realize over time in your studies is that everyone has the abilities. Right. <laughs> and you're just you're just virtue signaling. You are um it's ego driven to say that I have the answers. Right, it is. It, you know, everyone does. Yeah. And the only thing we can do is help guide people to their own understanding that you have every gift you need. You right, have exactly. everything you need. Exactly. So I learned all the little disciplines. And concurrently, I was working on my master's degree in transpersonal psychology. Well, this is not counseling psychology. It's not addiction psychology. Transpersonal psychology says that you have all the ability to be fully activated in your life. Mm -hmm. And a counselor, a psychologist can help bring you to that understanding of being an empowered and fully present person. Yes. And so I had the good fortune to study under two influential people in my life, Bill Roll, William G. Roll, who was the original Ghostbuster. 
He was was a Danish uh, uh, gentleman, and he is the person who inherited William Rhine's uh, studies from uh, Rhine's parapsychology research. So, and he was the editor of Parapsychology magazine. So I studied under him. He was my major professor Mm -hmm. for years. Um, And he really influenced my um, understanding of the world. He was a Mm -hmm. Buddhist monk. Okay. So uh, I, I learned a lot from him. And the other uh, is uh, the uh, Raymond Moody, okay. who was a professor, and we studied Life After Life. Right. He, he had just come out with his uh, seminal okay. book, Life yeah. After Life. Mm-hmm. And so the classes were so very different. Bill Roll lived on a lake. So if you were in graduate school, we went to his home. We arrived about four o'clock. We put dinner in the oven. We took classes for two hours. We (laughs) sat on the deck overlooking the river in rocking chairs, had dinner, and then continued the seminar for another two hours. But Raymond Moody, I can never stop envisioning him sitting in a rocking chair on that deck talking about his early interviews with people who had died and come back to life and the the white light the tunnel the seeing right. the spiritual being and so when i was here at the inner space a few years ago i reconnected with with raymond, yeah. with raymond. Mm-hmm. and he's he's extended his research into um how to do the psychomantium and mm-hmm. connect with people who've departed and he and others are studying uh, something now called shared death experiences. And what happened when Raymond Moody's own mother died is that he and his sister were at the bedside and observed her spirit leaving her body. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. And so he coined the term shared death experience for this because he saw the tunnel, the white light, okay. the relatives greeting his mother on the other side, and his sister did too. So it wasn't, you know, wishful thinking. Right, right. It wasn't made up or mm-hmm. like hallucinated. Yeah. yeah. So uh, reconnecting with Raymond has been a really um, wonderful thing in mm-hmm. the past eight or 10 years, how long he ever he's yeah. been coming here. Uh, but those people really influenced my life. And then in the 90s, I decided I need to refocus myself. Uh, and so I went through a period where I studied everything. You know, I have, okay, I understand the transpersonal psychology. You want to use meditation or prayer or centering or some activity, yoga, uh-huh. to um, connect your consciousness you also want to study uh, what what is the essence of your consciousness. Are you a three-dimensional being? Are you mental, spiritual, physical, astral, emotional, all these different bodies? How do you connect to the universe? What is your place in it? So in, uh, the, in the last few years, I've been studying it, my doctorate, getting a doctorate in metaphysics. And the things that are interesting me now are quantum mechanics because I love how science is proving mysticism because they're one in the same. Right, they are. They're, yeah. You know, if you explain it in terms of waves and vibration on the quantum physics side, and you explain it in terms of good vibes on the metaphysical side, same thing. It's the same, it's thing. same thing, right? It's the same thing. <laughs> so I. I have no real scientific background, but I'm studying with some scientists now at the University of Arizona and the esteemed Nobel laureate, Robert, mm-hmm. Robert Penrose, who is a mathematician. And I can't keep up with their mathematical computations, but I get the gist of what they're trying to I love to it decide. that you're like, put yourself in that though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would not be like, oh. <laughs> Well, I've been going to their conferences for a few years now, and uh, because of COVID, we've not met in person. So I'm going to hopefully do that this this year. But um, they push my ability to understand to its limits, which is a good thing. You need to stretch your mind. You stretch and you learn. 
And what you find is that these scientists are mystics. They are. They and, really are. <laughs> you know, Einstein was a mystic. Mm -hmm. And uh, on a different channel, what I do is work with a teacher through the Theosophical Foundation, and his name is Mitch Harwitz. And he's introduced me to um, an author who's now a long deceased named Neville Goddard. Yes. And Neville Goddard wrote a book is that's feeling is the secret. And all of us have heard in the last 20, 30 years, affirmations are important. And mm -hmm. I do affirmations. I have, you know, every day mm -hmm. I read certain affirmations, I recite them, I internalize them. But what Neville Goddard said is the rote reading of them may put them in your intellectual subconscious. But the key to changing your life is feeling. It really it's is. the emotion. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to have that oomph, that, yeah. that energy to make magic happen in your own life. So that's a long-winded way to tell you. I've taken every kind of route that you could possibly take, and I'm sure I'm going to find more. Because as Merlin said that first day, the purpose of life is to learn. Is. And so I took that message to heart and I, I believe that that's what we're about. It is. Mm. And you always approach things in a very grounded way. And that's very, um, it just brings in so many more people. And so like a few years ago, you were having a birthday. It was like your 30th birthday or something. And you said, I'm just considering this just a new beginning and I'm just going to learn more. And you told me that. And I was like, yeah, you're going to do it. And you always bring that to the people in whatever way you can. And I love that. And you always come back with, it's not just like woo woo stuff, right? The woo woo stuff matters, but you're like, this is what, this is what's happening. And here's why. Mm -hmm. Like, and I've really learned from that. I've learned that tell people the why. You're right. Um, one of the classes I'm asked to give the most is one that I call stones and bones. I love stones and bones. But I may rename that charm school. Char and I here is why. <laughs> um, I decided that tarot cards are interesting. Uh, I can read tea leaves in a cup or read palms and do all of those things. But the person on the other side of the table doesn't have that same knowledge. So I am setting myself up as the superior knowledge. You don't know what the tower means. Right. You don't know what the hanged man means or what right, Jupiter exactly, and Saturn exactly. mean. So I thought I need to make something that's very simple. So I, I realized I had in my jewelry box and on tables an assortment of small things that had meaning to me. Mm -hmm. I had a stone that I gathered from walking up the back of Stone Mountain. It was so hard to walk those last 400 it is. feet. That is hard. It's a hard <laughs> walk. But I decided as a part of my wellness uh -huh. journey to do it every weekend and eventually it became tolerable. But the first time I got up there, I was so proud of myself. I took a little piece of granite, a little granite stone, and that was my gold medal from the Olympics. So that little stone, even uh -huh. though it's just a nothing to uh -huh. anyone else, that stone has important emotional meaning to me. Uh, by the same token, I love the classical approach to the elements, air, fire, water, and mm -hmm. earth. Yes. And that they have a color attribute and they have a lunar attribute. So when I say a person is of water, it means they're emotional. They're in tune with their feelings. They're very intuitive. So I had symbols made for those elements in the colors that are appropriate. Those were part of my... Um, hanging around the house. I had symbols of love, hearts and crystals and all of that. Mm -hmm. So what I did was assemble those into a little um, bag and say, I'm going to try and do readings with these things. So I found something that stood for a man and a woman. And because in numerology, the man is the number one and the woman is the number mm -hmm. two, we get the idea that men are straight. You know, they have body parts that get rigid and straight. Right. And women uh -huh. are curvaceous and right. curvy. So I used a nail, 
and a seashell, mm -hmm. the straight thing and the curvy thing. So when I was reading, I said, when I read for a person, I'm going to throw these things onto a table. And if I tell the person on the other side, this brown seashell represents you. It's feminine, curvy, mm -hmm. like you are. Mm -hmm. And this nail represents the partner in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's see what these things around it say. The person and I do the reading together. And it's not that I'm giving any secret information. What I'm trying to do, part of the psychology training in me and part of the spiritual training in me, is helping this person have an aha moment. Have an aha, yes. <clears throat> right. And I'm not doing anything secret. Mm -mm. I, but when I, but for each person, the items fall in a mm -hmm. random pattern, but it has meaning and significance for that person. Right, it does. And I use my intuition, which we all have, to say, what does that configuration mean for you at this moment, right. at this time with this the time. issues you're facing? So I don't say I'm doing psychic greetings. I'm, I tell people we're going to have a little talk. Yes. We're going to talk. And so I always start by saying, what's going on in your life? And then I throw these little charms down. Some of them are, you know, from charm bracelets or whatever. They're just an assortment of small things. And then we talk about what we see. And all of that does is stimulate conversation. Right. And sometimes it reveals things that people don't want to tell you. You know, when you do reading mm -hmm. something, a card turns right. over and they don't want to tell you that. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. you asked about your, your work, but what your real question is about is my husband cheating on me. Right. You know? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Know? Am I going to go broke? And, you know, is there any hope for me to make right. more money, you know? Right. Uh, and so what they do is allow you to guide that person that you're mm -hmm. giving the talk mm -hmm. with to their own insights and their own revelations. Mm -hmm. And it's empowering to them. It is. So I like to teach classes like that, that have the woo woo factor to them because you're doing a reading, but also <laughs> teach everyone that we're the same. We're the same. Right? You're not better than I am. I'm not better than you. We're, we're, we're part of the same entity, you know, at, um, at a metaphysical level, we're cells in the same body. Yes. You know, we're, we're part of the same universe and it's no different than having a fingernail cell cell and a liver cell. Right. We're part of the same organism at a macro level. So to think that a liver cell is better than a fingernail cell, it's just not it true. Now. We're all the same. We're all the, the same part. So by using teachings to help people activate, uh, find an awareness within themselves is what brings me joy. Good. Yeah. And I always, um, every class you, you, you teach, I get the most excellent feedback. Oh, thank you. I really, really do. And then you, because I have you at my retreats and you're the one of the most requested teachers. You're, you know, like just the, everybody says, Oh, is that lady teaching? And oh. I know they're talking about Teresa. <laughs> oh, you're so kind. I, I find the HYDF retreats to be the, my favorite place to teach. First of all, we're bringing a lot of women together who are educated, they're spiritually right. educated. Mm -hmm. They're spiritual people. They have a strong practice in their own lives. Some of them are in bad places in their life yeah. and striving to do yeah. better. So who better to talk with than a, than a group of women like that? But the re retreats are wonderful because they take you out of your home environment. Some of the times your cell phone doesn't work, which is good because you're there to focus on spiritual, divine growth, entrepreneurship, elegance, and empowerment. Right. And so the retreats give me the opportunity to talk to women that I wouldn't meet otherwise and to connect with them, learn from them. And the classes I like to work on, and I always like that I do something different, that you ask me to do something different because it, it requires me to research and work and prepare. but to see the women get excited about they an do. idea they do. is yes. is really rewarding. It it's gratifying. So when I um, 
it's okay. So I always get these like downloaded like messages, right? And one of them was the spiritually immature women thinks they're the exception to every rule. Like, no, not me. I'm special. I'm, I'm special. I'm different. Not me. And the spiritually mature woman knows we're all the same. Oh. And you really, really hold that. And this is how I see it. When there's women that come to any of my events, right? And they'll come with a friend or whatever. They'll be sitting in the corner by themselves talking. And you immediately go up and you're like, hi, I'm Teresa. And you sit down and you find a way to connect. And oftentimes there are people that like, are, I love it. like, I worked with you in 1972. <laughs> this happens like magically. And I'm like, yes. And even if you don't know them from the past, you find a way to connect and it completely changes them. And because they, you hold that energy because you give off the energy. We're the same. It's fine. Like, it's cool. And it doesn't matter what background they come from, what color they are, what religion they come from, why are they here? What, you know, some people come because they're like, this is my last hope in life. Is this retreat? And I'm scared. And some people come and they're like me and you and they're like, yes, we just love the spiritual retreats. That's right. <laughs> and everyone in between. And you always have, hold that energy of, I'm you and you're me. Let's have a cookie together. Mm -hmm. Have you tried these desserts? <laughs> and I, I see them break. Like I literally see a wall come down when you sit oh, down. Oh, that's, that's nice to hear. You do that in every class <laughs> that you end. You close your classes with namaste. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? It the means light in me. The light and yes. the divine in me recognizes and honors the divine yes. in you. And if we all treated each other that way, namaste, the divine in me recognizes and honors and sees the divine in you, we'd have such a wonderful world. Yes, we, <laughs> yeah, would. we would. We would. And you bring all this history, right? All this knowledge from sitting with great teachers. Like you've sat with the greats in person mm -hmm. in that. Like I've had, like I've met Raymond Moody and he's cool, um, but he's, you've actually sat with him. Like I've sat with him in a room of like a hundred people, like, <laughs> right? But um, you bring all this energy to your classes, like all this from the great teachers that happened with their, they had original content and they didn't pull up YouTube to figure it out. Right. Oh. That's what's amazing about you is because you do come with original content. Mm -hmm. uh, I've just been the luckiest person alive, uh, you know, starting with how I was raised and having uh, strong spiritual connections from birth uh, and understanding that that can be a powerful influence in your life. Now, do I think that, all of the dogma of churches are correct. No, but do I believe and honor every faith and every religion? What you want to believe is fine with me. Um, absolutely. Whatever, whatever faith or path you want to take, that's your journey to awareness. Who am I to say a person's right. wrong? It, you're not you're at not. all. No. At all. And you do have a way of just like making everyone feel at ease around you and not being afraid to share your past with that, which I think is very, very important in spiritual leadership today because we have all these people that come up and they're not sharing where they came from or the journey they had. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was at um, talking, I was at a retreat one day and we were in like the leader's cabin and of course I was having, I'm a Pisces. I was having like love drama. Of course. <laughs> of course I was having, and I was like, oh my God, like I was feeling sorry for myself. It's shame. Like I was carrying shame about it. And you were like, I said, oh, this is my third relationship. And you said, you're an amateur. <laughs> and it made me feel so much better because I was like, you know what? I'm thought, like, it made me feel like, okay. Cause you know, we carry these um, issues in, in like an isolated manner. And you let people know, like, no, you're normal. Oh, my goodness. You are, you're in a great relationship now. Yes. And yes. let me tell you, I think you found the right one. And it's a journey for all of us. Yes. But I have some thoughts about love that I, I'm glad you brought this up. I, uh, I have had failed relationships uh -huh. my whole life. And I know why. It's a personal reason, but I know why they uh, didn't work out. Because I was, the essence of it is, I was searching for someone to make me complete. Right. And however the relationship was, the marriage or the live-in situation, it didn't make me complete because I wasn't complete. 
I was looking for someone to make me whole. Right. And the answer is, if you're searching for someone to make your, you whole, and if you feel the gaping void inside you, no one is ever going to be able to fill it. No one's ever going to make you be whole. You are whole. Right. You fill that with yourself. You fill that with your own self-love, your self-study your own healthy lifestyle right, and practices. Right, no one can make you No. Fall. Um, so I think people often search for artificial love when we should be searching for partners who lift us up, but aren't essential to our feeling loved by ourselves. Absolutely. Yes. You know? And so I think, you know, but yes, I have a, a litany of failed relationships because I always wanted that person to make me feel good about myself. Right. And now I'm at a place in my life where I do feel good about myself yes. and I have for some time, but I know that I don't need anyone to make me whole. And I'm surrounded by uh, women and men that I love deeply. Of course. And uh, but I don't need that particular kind of relationship to make me, uh, feel as if I'm one with the universe and I'm worthy and I'm good. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, as long as you reach that destination, that's fine. And, you know, I always like to leave open the possibility. My thoughts can evolve. Absolutely. They can, you know, they can change. Can change. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We, so what I met you doing a psychic fair mm -hmm. and spirit always just puts me in the right place at the right time. I'll never forget <laughs> the way we met. Um, I was doing a reading here in this room uh, with my charms, with my stones and bones. And this lady reached over and said to me, do you want to give the keynote speech at my upcoming ceremony for <laughs> goddesses? And I said, Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Never met her. But Spirit was like, that's the lady. And I was like, okay. <laughs> well, what Andrea didn't know at the time is I've spent a lifetime giving presentations <laughs> on every kind of topic. In my work life, I do that all the time. Um, so it was not, you know, someone asking me to give a presentation that happens every week for me, but this lady wanted me to speak at her goddess awards banquet. And this will be coming up on the, it's on March 11th. And I was going to ask you to speak again and it's the 10th or 11th. I uh, think. It, it's, it's, it's been, been a, a while. Of years. And uh -huh. so I don't, you just held that goddess energy. And I was just like, we did, that's the thing with like, when you're like really like a true intuitive, like a true like goddess, you know, there's like no words. I didn't have to look at your resume. I didn't have to find you on LinkedIn. I just had to sit next to you and I was like, yep, she's the one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm forever grateful that your intuition led us to meet that way because uh, I recently found a picture at the, of the first HYDF ah. retreat. <laughs> and to see your personal evolution in these retreats. Now, I didn't attend the first one where it was you creating a weekend on a whim and on a shoestring shoe budget, <laughs> uh, you know, scraping by uh -huh. and with uh, a collection of women who just thought it would be a good idea to get away to the mountains, yeah. and, you know, and to see the evolution to what has become a premier feminist, goddess-oriented, strong, powerful women retreat has been amazing. So I've been able to watch the journey of you moving along these years to having from your intuitive beginning, a structure, an organization, a nonprofit, yes. giving back yes. to others, uh, helping needy women with feminine hygiene products and foundation garments, bras and underwear. Um, and to giving back to a community, helping lots of women in need, mm -hmm. whether it's through counseling, healing, or financially. Uh, this woman has helped many oh. people who were being <laughs> evicted, who were being abused, uh, being arrested, being, you know, in any kind of troubling situation. 
Andrea is a focal point for generating a lot of community support. And what I like is that HYDF is not an organization, it's a community. Yes, it's a community. Yeah. That's my focus is because we need communities of mm -hmm. strong women. And I always say, um, one of the other ladies said, oh, just put out the bat signal. And she started referring to the logo as the bat signal. <laughs> and I liked that. I was like, yeah, the bat signal. And so whenever I sort of, somebody comes to me and they're like, so-and-so is in need. They're not telling you. They're, you know, they've got their phone cut off or the power scrap or they have kids or it's Christmas. I just sort of put out the bat signal. And then you're one of the, pri you're always one of the first ones that, what do we need? Who needs something? Like, what, what do we need to do? Well, let me tell you. I'm going to tell you a personal story. You don't know the ending of it. You know the beginning <laughs> of it. One of the ladies needed some money. Um, and I don't, the reason isn't important, but she needed some money urgently. And I sent her some money by PayPal. And a month ago, I called Andrea and I said, do you know this email address? This person just sent me $500. And it turns out that that woman paid back in multiples what I gave her. Mm -hmm. The following week, someone near and dear to me called and said, I need $500. Mm -hmm. That money, that, that generosity that that woman did in paying it back, mm -hmm. which we all have an obligation to pay it forward, pay it back, allowed me to help yet another person who yes. was in you know, it, in risk of losing a job and other things. So it's just a way of building a community that continues to give. It's, it's wonderful. Yes. Yes. Because that's kind of the spirituality of finances too. And you really understand the spirituality of finances. You always have, right? That's right. And you don't have to even put together a curriculum or teaching it in a, in a way. You just show up in a room and people get it. Like, that's right. That's all they Teresa. I don't care if you teach. I just need you to sit in the room. <laughs> and the retreats. <laughs> well, a, a money I realized just a few years ago, I've always been able to accumulate money, but I've never been good at managing money. But I, a few years ago, I decided money is there. Yeah. You know, money, uh. you know, and you're a magician at this. You, you know, you <laughs> can manifest money. But what you do is you let, you stop obsessing about a poverty mindset right and start dealing with a wealth mindset and as neville goddard said you've got feeling is the secret i'm wealthy and not you know i'm not a millionaire but if you think about how we are in this country compared to the rest of the world we're in the top one percent globally yes even if we're scraping by even if we're you know our car is on its last good tire we're wealthy Right. And for you to think that you're driving an old beater car with four bald tires and you're poor mm -mm. misses the point. Yes. You've got transportation. Right. Exactly. So much of the world does it. You've got had education. Right. There are many places in the world where women aren't allowed to go to school. Right. So we're blessed in, and having that mindset allows money to flow to you. It, it allows does. wealth to flow to you and it allows you to not obsess about how am I going to pay a bill? Right. You're going to be able to pay a bill Absolutely. and you're going to be able to give generously to other people. Um, and that's just the way it works. You're, it it's is. the mindset. It's the mindset. You, um, one of my favorite classes you've taught is marketing. I always go back to that in my head where you use the you used examples of like Apple and Nike. And that really, that helped a lot of women in small businesses. And when, um, you help a lot of women understand things like LGBTQ, right? You help, you, you come in with this like, no, and a very grounded foundation of explanations. Oh, well, uh, you know, uh, you, you're, you're flattering and you're, you're almost embarrassing, <laughs> but I thank you. And more than I could, that. you know, I tend to be in the sky a lot and I just will assume people know, you know, they assume they're picking up what I'm putting down. Right. And, and you're, you're like, and then when I say something, and I'm like, oh, yes, we're channeling the manifestations from whatever, right? And then you'll sit down and you'll be like, so what we're actually doing. <laughs> I'll be like, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, in that movie, what's the movie where Patrick Swayze and, the pot, and Demi Moore and the yes, pottery and yes. Whoopi Goldberg says, girl, you in trouble. You know, that's the practical side. Of it me. is. It really you know, is. Girl, 
the spirits are around you saying, stop what you're doing. You stop know? what you're doing. And everyone <laughs> wants a reading from you all the time. They want to chat. They want a conversation with Teresa. Like they just do. And you very much hold yourself where you don't just give anybody that chat. You've got to be able to really like be ready to make changes. Mm -hmm. And I really respect that. You're like, like if you're not ready to make changes in your life, no. Because, you know, I will be blunt. <laughs> Yeah, I will say things that are uncomfortable and I'm okay saying things that are uncomfortable because they're not intended to harm. They're intend to say what's on your mind already. Absolutely. You know, um, but if you're doing something that is harmful to yourself, then you need to say that to the person. You need to say, you know better, do better, right. be better. Right, you exactly. Know. And you really hold space for people over 50. Oh, yeah. When I started the, the retreats, even I was in my 30s, um, and then I had you come in and it gave everybody over 50 that, like, you validated me, really, because what I was saying, and you would sit down and be like, no, Andrea is right. This is what she's actually doing <laughs> when I was running around with my head in the sky, not landing on Earth. She's the real deal. <laughs> you know? yeah. And you were like, no, she's, this is what she's doing and she's right. But you always hold space for that. And I really, really appreciate that because... Uh, women over that was so we have women that come that are 80 and you hold space for that so well and that's really it's not i want every woman there in my intention but they'll be like oh my gosh i'm here with a bunch of 20 year olds this is going to be weird and then you're like no it's not sit down and you just put everyone at ease so oh, you're you're just so kind that's like oh. a marginalized community it really is because they come in what gets me okay when people older come in and they're like we have to be secret about our gifts and i come i walk around and i'm like i am goddess andrea <laughs> 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 i'm not in the closet about anything I, would you like to be on my tv show and they look at me like in total fear and you remind me and you're like no they're used to hiding yeah. And I grew up in that age yeah. too. When you wanted, uh, when I was in my teens, if you wanted to meditate, you were weird. Right. You know, but at the same time, the popular music had the Beatles and uh, Timothy Leary acid and dropping out and taking trips and getting in tune and the cosmic consciousness um, uh, wavy gravy out in San Francisco and the hippie buses and all, <laughs> you know, it made it open and acceptable, but it was still in popular culture, but it was really hidden. Mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the foundational things that they were describing were, were still not spoken and women were not encouraged. And if you look at literature about whether it's, uh, metaphysics or spirituality or magic or anything like this it's male dominated the authors are male if you go yes. into a bookstore there there is a lack of feminine right. leaders now there's some outstanding ones you know start with Pima Chodron, Joan right. Chittiser and uh, Jean Houston and um, uh, even Oprah mm -hmm. you know there's some profound teacher women teachers but they're the minor minority so what I really like about working with women in harnessing your divine feminine is that we're empowering a group of strong principled feminine powerful leaders and you don't have to be in a church or a group or anything you can just hold yourself out to be a power powerful woman spiritual person right and it can be at any age you bring in a diverse group of people from 18 years old to 80 and I'm at one end. I'm staring very uh, closely at the number seven O. Oh, <laughs> no, uh, but, no. Uh, but there's, but, but the, you don't have, age is not an indicator of spiritual advancement or growth. No, it, it's, it's just a number. Uh, like with all things, it's just a number. I, I want to talk about one of the things that you've helped me refine and articulate. So people ask you well, from the time you're a child, what is your life goal? I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a cowgirl. I want to be a teacher. Um, and as you grow older, you say, oh, I want to be a, a manager, a leader, a, an executive. Or you might want to say, I want to be a mother. I want to be a role model. I want to be on a school mm -hmm. board member. Uh, and all of us are told to have these goals. And 
a few years ago, I was studying with a gentleman named Patrick San Francesco from Goa, India, about a method of healing. And it's using uh, pranic healing and colors. And the reason that I like studying with him is that he had, he was, he, he was a physician, a trained physician, but he understood from being uh, from India, the importance of spirituality and healing. And you said at one point, what do you want to do? What is your goal here? And my goal, I decided only because of your prompting is I want to be able to walk into a room and sit next to someone and they feel healed mm -hmm. in some way. Mm -hmm. Now it can be physically, it can be mentally, emotionally, spiritually, mm -hmm. psychically, but I want to be a vehicle for healing. So I finally decided on a career goal at this stage in my life is to be a healer, not in laying on hands. I can do that. Mm -hmm. Not in Reiki. I could do mm -hmm. that, but I just want to be in your presence and make you feel better yes. in some way. And I think if I can reach the end of my life sometime in the far future, and I can say that I've gone about the world, whether it was the checkout person at the grocery or the uh, person walking on the street or uh, the woman walking a dog next to me. Right. When they left my being around me, they were a little bit better for having known me. That's a life well lived. It is. And I think, I mean, you've got it. You're doing it now. How can people reach you? Uh, two places. I will say kudzucenter.com, K-U-D-Z-U, -U, kudzu like the vine, kudzucenter.com. And center is so that we always know to go in our center. Um, and if you go to that website, you can find a link to me there. You can find my phone number. And the other way to contact me is to write me at Teresa, T-E-R-E-S-A at kudzucenter.com. And I love to do readings for people. I call them talks. I say, I'll talk with you. And I do that at home in person and by Zoom. I like the anonymity of doing readings by phone mm -hmm. because people get nervous when they're in front of you, yes. they always think mm -hmm. you're, they're being judged. And there's a certain anonymity to talking over the phone that allows people to let their guard down. But I'll do, a, I'll do a talk with anyone, anytime, anywhere. Uh, I love to teach classes and I do them at your retreats. I'm uh, bringing one to uh, Mystic South. I hope Very that that's fun. Uh, uh, accepted. And I've done them at Unity Center in Missouri for the Theosophical Foundation mm -hmm. and other places. And I hope to continue doing that as well. And I do, I do them online. Once in a while, I do them online. Okay, so if you have an organization or a business or you're just an individual and you want Teresa to present her years of knowledge, to you or your group or your family, just reach out to her. You can also find her at www.hydf.online. I can personally reach out to her too. So any final words of wisdom you want to share? Love is the answer. And I want to quote Tom Robbins uh, from the book, Still Life with Woodpecker. Love is the ultimate outlaw. It simply will not follow any rules. The best we can do is sign on as its accomplice. I love you for free. That's thank you it. so much. Thank you for giving the many women opportunities. And you're so welcome. And thank you for listening or watching today. Remember, go out and give a woman an opportunity today. Bye. The Harnessing Your Divine Feminine Show is produced by Eve Robinsons TV. Subscribe for only $30 per year for access to exclusive and archived content. Visit www.the8robinsons.tv. Thank you for watching.